Hi, this is Sean Perrin, and you're listening to episode 60 of the Clarinet Podcast, the show where I discuss all that's new and neat with clarinet with the neatest people in the industry. In today's episode of the podcast, I'm joined by the wonderful Eugene Mondi, who is the acting principal clarinet of the National Symphony Orchestra in Washington, D.C. He shares his thoughts on why you shouldn't get sentimental about your gear, what kinds of adjustments you need to make if you want to play with a double lip embouchure, both as a player and to your reeds, a lot of advice on being an adaptable musician, mastering your auditions, and much, much more. Detailed show notes for this and all other episodes are available at www.clarinet.com. Patreon backers now get access to extended versions of episodes just like this one. If you'd like to learn more about how you can get access to this and other bonus content presented in high-resolution audio, see clarinet.com slash Patreon. Today's episode was brought to you by our sponsor, Dedaria Woodwinds. Thank you so much for listening. Sanding, shaping, balancing. For centuries, mastering your instrument meant mastering these crafts too. But now, D'Addario is refining craftsmanship for the 21st century by refining their reeds and mouthpieces with the world's most innovative techniques, so you can spend less time sanding, shaping, and balancing, and more time perfecting your own craft. To learn more about the new era of craftsmanship from D'Addario Woodwinds, visit D'Addario.com slash woodwinds. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today, Eugene. It's my pleasure. So it's been absolutely wonderful. I also want to thank uh, Joel Jaffe and Bakun Musical for setting up the last couple interviews here. It's been so fantastic to sort of catch some really great artists on their way through uh, Vancouver at the at the factory there. Um, what brings you to town to check out um, Bakun's facilities? Are you having your clarinets worked on? I am. Um, I'm getting some work done on them, um, but I'm also here to try, you know, the usual barrels and bells and that kind of thing. And but also, you know, they've always got stuff to try, and it's always interesting to to uh, see what's new here, you know. And there's always something, which is pretty amazing. There is, there is. They got all kinds of stuff in the works. So one thing I wanted to ask you about, actually, and I I, I don't want to spend the whole time talking about equipment, but I I was able to watch a few videos of you online discussing um, your sort of views on equipment, and I will be linking to those in the show notes. Um, but you mentioned really not becoming uh, mentally and sentimentally attached to equipment. Would you go into that a little bit and sort of explain your philosophy and how that lets you pick new, new equipment? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. I think, um, I think one of the things that we have a hard time as, as clarinet players is we sort of become attached. We sort of have a sort of confirmation bias, if you will, of this particular piece of equipment or this maker or whatever is, is, is the best and it's what we should use. And, um, I think we, uh, depending on in the hall and, and the circumstance and, and the orchestra, the pitch, that kind of thing, uh, we always have to make adjustments. And I think if you if you get a little too stuck with something, you know, saying, you know, my teacher used this or whatever, I, I think it can um, limit you. And, and it's hard to be objective, you know, I mean, because ultimately you want to sound our best, of course. And um, I think we're always kind of tweaking that uh, given our circumstance. And so... As well with the equipment, um, you mentioned that finding it for something like a mouthpiece, for example, is such a personal endeavor. Um, what does it mean for you when you go looking for an, a mouthpiece? Are you looking for it from an artistic standpoint or are you thinking more about its practical use as a tool? Well, all of those things. I think you're balancing, um, you know, the, the components of the sound. You know, Mr. Montanaro was really, uh, I think, brilliant in, in that way in terms of um, describing the sound of uh, you know, focus, cover, and amplitude. And I think the practical side of that, of course, is the sort of response, um, the the hold, the things that uh, allow you to kind of let go a little bit. And uh, just from a practical standpoint, you know, what the, what the sound is and, and um, in, um, in the orchestra. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think um, uh, all those things are, are really, really critical. I'm tempted in a way to discuss which equipment you choose and why, but I'm almost, I think it'd be more compelling to talk about 
wh- how is it that you think that someone can come up with their own concept and feel of the equipment that they should be choosing for themselves? Where can they get that sort of guidance, especially after graduation? I mean, a lot of people, as they move through their careers, right. they're, they're still experimenting with equipment and you, you sort of lose that connection to someone to advise you on that way. How can you sort of find your own path? Well, I, I think, um, you know, I think it starts with understanding that we're trying to imitate the human voice at some mm-hmm. level. You know, um, you know, if you listen throughout the world, there's a, a lot of different uh, interpretations of what that could be, you know. Um, but I think that's where it comes from. And if, you know, I'll, we start with that, but then um, knowing what those components are, I think the hardest thing um, is actually hearing it. I think we all make the assumption that our ears are, are born hearing everything and being your, you know, the connection between your ears and, and your brain. Um, and actually I think we all, um, have to develop that. It's a, it's like a tool like your eyesight or anything or taste or, um, you hone it and you develop it. Um, if, uh, and I think that's one of the, the things that a teacher can do actually, it's really important is to sort of show what I was talking about at the beginning of the c- components of sound, of, of focus, of cover, amplitude, um, and balancing those things between the necess- you know, you know, response, uh, the practicality of getting a read to match with the equipment, all those sorts of things. But I think um, initially it, it is actually learning to hear those things. Um, and uh, because so often we we gravitate towards how something feels and we immediately respond to that. Um, and but again, also the the other thing we haven't really talked about is being aware of how equipment uh, works in terms of reads. For example, if you're playing cane, the complexity of a read is really miraculous. I mean, it's just so complicated. It changes so much. Um, and knowing what you're dealing with and, and what you want to live with, you know, if you have an open facing or if you're close facing, that kind of thing. So the open facing versus closed facing. And I also, I've heard you discuss in other um, instances, sort of this concept of high flow versus low flow camps right. of playing. Um, right. where, where do you sit in, in that regard? And uh, could you maybe explain both of those ideologies for someone who may not know? Uh, yeah, sure. Basically the idea is, you know, uh, I think, the best way I could describe it is like with German players, for example, is the idea of, of trying to allow a more natural um, use of the air in the sense of, of blowing and um, using the airspeed, a high rate of airspeed to determine the quality of sound, The you know, and um, the other side of that coin, I think, would be a, what I would consider a more vocal approach. The idea of that sort of support, um, trying to, as you know, obviously, with singers, they don't run out of air after two notes. So they're not trying to dump the air out. They're not trying to push the air. Um, I think with the a low flow approach, essentially you're, you're slowing the airspeed down um, and it's a little bit more stable, I think, be, just because the air, the pressure of the, um, the air in the oral cavity is low enough so that it doesn't, it, it's a little more stable as it goes into the instrument. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it, it's, there are advantages and disadvantages. I mean, you have to be very careful with the low flow uh, as you sort of get the support, you know, lower down, um, to not allow tension to, to come up and, and your whole body can, it, it, it can be a, a negative if you're not careful. Uh, I think we all start playing a uh, high flow kind of approach. And, um, it's certainly the first thing we have to learn. I, I think it's sort of, uh, you, you gotta get the air through the instrument at first, otherwise it's just not possible to play. One thing I've talked about before on this podcast, which has sort of reached a point of contention with some people, is uh, do you think about the air being a different temperature or feel uh, in that way? Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I mean, I definitely think of, a, you know, hot or, or, or moist air. And I think the reason uh, I like that is not so much that you're actually changing the composition of the humidity or any of that sort of thing, mm-hmm. but it's it's how the, the soft palate, it's how your throat um, the tongue, all those things kind of naturally, uh, position. And, and one of the things I do as a, as a teacher is, and the way I was taught was talking in terms of systems, you know, you can't really isolate specific muscles in the oral cavity or, um, can't really control the tongue 
uh, consciously in the sense I'm going to put this part up and this part down. What we can do is use natural things that we do now. We're like, for instance, talking, uh, where we're no longer uh, can do it unconsciously. You know, you don't you're not thinking of of the the mechanics of the oral cavity and the the tongue, um, and that's one of those things. You think of warm air. Um, you know, some people want to. It, it it almost doesn't really matter what depending it's up to you what you want to do, you know, what you, the advantages and then the negatives that you want with any particular way of playing. Um, but using it, thinking in terms of the systems, I think is the, the appropriate, because then, uh, your body respond, your mind responds to those things in a, in a much better way. And I think also when you start talking specifics and very, really what people do is they create tension and, uh, to give them the sensation that they're actually controlling something. And, and I think the reality is that we're actually just, kind of lock jaw, you know, kind of thing where it's just, it, it's not, uh, um, you're not actually doing anything other than creating tension. And I think that has a big impact on the way we sound. If, if everything's way too tight, we lose the softness. You know, it's like a great singer uh, has this a velvet quality to the sound, that cover, if you will, and uh, tension will, is a big killer of that, I think. Do you think um, that these ways of describing how this feels, whether hot or cold or high flow and low flow and all these different things. Do you think that they are in some way misidentifying what we're actually doing? You sort of hinted at trying to describe it with words, um, with vocal elements instead of with these kind of analogies. Right. I think the, um, uh, my understanding is, is that we really don't know specifically certain things uh, about even with singing. We have a, you know, because you're jamming a tube down people to, to see to, so we don't necessarily know um, the other thing is the, the variation in the physiology of people. I mean, everything's slightly different. So we're, we're compensating in slightly different ways to get at the same result. Um, do we know in a scientific way? No, I, I don't think so. I mean, I'm, I'm telling you anecdotally and from experience, and um, I can't tell you in any sort of absolute sense. But um, the, the experience that I have is, is that these work much better. Um, than a more specific, like put this here or that. Yeah. Just, and because the physiology is so different, you know, you look at, um, you know, someone's the size of their head, the size of their jaw, um, the depending on their sex, the, the lung capacity, the height, all these sorts of different things, you know, um, make a huge difference. And it's more about the relationships. I think that's the biggest thing is no matter what you're talking in terms of equipment or anything, it's about the relationships of, of the, the equipment to get the result rather than a specific one size fits all. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and with gear too, it's so risky too, because if you, if you start using something simply because someone else is using it, it may not be the best fit for you. And, and for all the reasons you just talked about. So um, yeah. One other question about that. I, I noticed that you use what I would consider to be personally a, a really, really hard read. It's, you said five plus, I believe. Is that is that still the case? Um, no, I, I'm not. Uh, I, I think uh, I'm definitely um, gravitating no, now towards much softer cane. Oh, OK. Green. Yeah. I, I just found that the, what I was trying to get with the five was sort of uh, a depth of sound and sort of stability. But um, as time's gotten has gone on, I've gotten better at working on reeds. I, I really prefer the softer cane and, and then making adjustments. The other thing that I really love is the new Van Doren reed clipper, which I think is brilliant. Um, and that's made a huge difference uh, being able to clip. You know, before that, it was just kind of a nightmare clip and it'd be, you know, this or it, it just it really made things a lot easier. Is this a brand new product? When did it come out? It's been a couple of years now. Yeah, it's a little pricey, but I, I mean, I I would, I use it every day, you know, really? and it makes incredibly small cuts with it. You know, it's not like you're taking big chunks. If you're, if you're careful and discreet about it, you can quite, uh, um, be, uh, very limiting in the amount of material taking off. So do you spend a lot of times, uh, adjusting your reads and, and making sure that they're perfect or do you just kind of take what you get and work with it? Oh, uh, no, I do. I mean, I, I think that's, uh, it's a real art. Um, and I think it's an important one you know, making the adjustments to, to the read because it just, if you, uh, if you look at cane and you, you take a read and, and you, you, for example, if you take a gauge, uh, um, and you measure the thickness, you'll see that as you're breaking it in, as you're playing it, it's changing, you know, significantly and not just that, but also, um, you know, the places on each read where it's harder or softer change as well. So you're mm -hmm. dealing 
learning to make adjustments that way. And, um, and I think it's a real, um, uh, important thing that, you know, I mean, when I go to, you know, I get to the stage an hour before the concert, make some slight adjustments. I mean, it's not like I'm, I'm totally remaking the read, but I, I'm making slight adjustments because, you know, the weather changes. I mean, you have one day it's, uh, you know, uh, raining, the next day it's cold and, and dry, and then the next day it's, you know, another, it's in the 70s, 80s, you know. And so um, I think you, if you don't learn how to do it, I think it, it uh, limits your ability to, to want to be consistent and also to your music making. I mean, you're just not able to do what you want to do. What is your preferred read now for Van Dorn? Is it the the V12s? Well, I kind of go all over the place. I, and I think the the that's one thing with that I, I work with students and 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 telling them that um, it's useful to have a variety of different kinds of, of reads. Um, you know, just so that you you have options because they have different attributes. You know, the the depending on the the thickness and the the shape. Um, and the profile of, of the read, you have a lot of different options and sometimes it really makes a difference, you know, in the winter you want certain things. I took, you know, the, um, I think a lot of people gravitate towards like a traditional, um, and, or especially during the weather changes, I find that that's the biggest yeah. successful, but then sometimes when it's really people in really cold climates, you know, the Rulu peak or, um, uh, those sort of the, their thicker blanks are people prefer, you know, and, um, so, yeah, I mean, it's always a struggle, but uh, it's, it's, it's definitely uh, a huge thing. It's important, I should say. Have you tried those new V21s? I have. I mean, that's the other one I was going to say. Yeah. That's thicker, thicker, a uh, blank um, and sort of trying to, to um, compensate. I think the brilliant thing is actually the, the fact that in a lot of ways, a lot of the, the ideas about reads and, um, you know, equipment in general, the ideas are, aren't new. It's the execution and, and manufacturing that is quite remarkable. Um, and I think that's, that's the amazing thing because the shapes are, there's nothing new about that. So one, one more quick question about um, sort of your, your setup and the way that things are, are working for you. Yeah. I could be wrong, but I believe that you play exclusively with the double lip embouchure. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. For someone who has very little experience with that or who may be interested in playing that way, is there any yeah. advice you can give for getting started or being consistent with it? I, I hear so many great players play with it. And Ricardo Morales actually was on the other day and he said that he's never heard someone, um, or there's never someone that he found that didn't sound better with double lip. And I'm yeah. wondering, wondering why it happens that way and how someone could get into it and, and why you chose to play that way in the first place. Well, I think two things, um, there's two main benefits. I think one is the, the way you, you use the air forces you to use the air. Um, the second is the, the fact that it, the oral cavity opens up slightly and that the, the back of the jaw primarily relaxes and releases a little bit. So there's not a, a clench. And so I think the, the danger of the double up is that you get an awe or kind of, uh, maybe if, forgive me, a more English kind of 10, 10 kind of sound. Mm -hmm. And, um, the, the benefit is you kind of use the air. There's a little bit more fluidity to the sound, the note to no connections improves. And, and for me, that's the biggest thing is that, that that's what attracted me to it. All, all those things. Um, I think the caution I would have, um, is with students is, is, um, if you really wanted to make a transition is that recognizing your reads have to be different. You can't, the reads that you buy commercially, you have uh, that are all set up for single lip players essentially. And so just using a software read doesn't really do it. The, the, where you need the material to be, uh, is in a, in a different place. So that, oh, interesting that's thing because you're letting go slightly, you don't have quite the, the jaw pressure. So you need a little bit more hold, um, and not just in the, the read, but also in the mouthpiece, I think. Yeah, and that's what I was wondering actually about how you were playing a, f a very firm read with the, with the double lip. So you're actually reshaping the read to match your exact needs. Right. Ex exactly. And I think that's one of the things that I've, I've been learning. I think the, the really neat thing about, um, what we do and, and what I would, I, you know, I'm, I'm 46 and, um, Every day I'm learning something new and, and there's always something, you know, um, with Ricardo here the other day, it was it, fascinating because we have different, different outlooks and yet at the same time we're trying to solve 
some of the same problems. And, um, you know, you learn something, you know, maybe you agree with it, maybe you don't agree with it, but it's, it's, um, it, it's just really amazing how, and, and, and that's, what's fun about it is it, it's just a never ending process. And I, I think that's actually quite, quite nice to know that I, for the rest of my life, I'll be continue to learn. Yeah, absolutely. I, I appreciate actually that you have that mindset, even in your prestigious role. Um, how do you think that sort of as a section, the double lip fits in as far as like blend and balance goes? I mean, you say that um, it sounds better to play that way, but yeah. in what way does it sound better? Does it improve the tone? Is it improving the clarity of the articulation? And then do your other section members have to also play that way or can they continue oh, to? No, no. I think that's the... Um, um, yeah, I think it, well, the, the two questions are, I guess, you know, the first part of it, yeah, it does improve it. It creates problems in the sense that you don't quite have the endurance, you have sort of limitations and, and you have to be careful. Like, for example, um, even though um, I said I use an extract because it, there is, you don't have quite the grip on the embouchure that you would with a single lip. So if you're playing something quite technical, you can get a little bit of a bounce. And so I have to be very careful and really work at not moving. Um, and so there's negatives. I mean, like everything's, you know, positive or negative and you have to be the determination of what you want to live with. And, mm -hmm. um, but in terms of, you know, playing with my colleagues, you know, Paul Sagan, um, uh, you know, studied with Mr. Giuliani and we have different concepts again about certain things, but there's a lot that we actually share. And, um, I, you know, he, they definitely share that. I think, he, Mr. Giuliani taught the idea of, of trying to imitate the double lip with a single lip embouchure. So I think there's a lot of similarity that way. And mm -hmm. it doesn't really change pitch issues. You know, it's a funny thing. Um, um, I, I find that people that you can play on totally different equipment and um, have a different outlook and stuff like that, but some people just can play together. You know what I mean? It's interesting. You just yeah. find it. Yeah. Well, that's interesting, actually. I was going to ask as well how it affects the tuning tendencies, but you're saying that. I guess once you've got that musical mind and the ability to adjust, you're, you're able to compensate. Yeah, I'm sure you have to be aware. I think the, the, the biggest mistake sometimes we, we all make is thinking that a certain piece of equipment is going to be bulletproof and, and solve all these different problems. Um, there's no horn that's perfectly in tune. There's no mouthpiece that's perfect. Um, what you're looking for are the, the components and what you can sort of live with and, and what you want and which goes a certain direction. And um, because the reality is most of us could, could pick up anything and play it, we just wouldn't be doing what we really want to do and we wouldn't be able to do the expressive things that we, we all have, we all think uh, and, and feel. So. so what is it like to lead a, an orchestra of this caliber in the clarinet section or even to play in a section like that? I mean, what things are, are, are happening within the section that we may not be aware of externally? Well, I think, um, I mean, it starts with the first question. I, I think the idea of leading is kind of um, a little, it's a different world. Let me put it that way. I, I don't think that way. Um, you know, you, 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 you work with your colleagues, you know I mean? I think there's a certain amount of, um, respect and realizing that it, you know that a lot of people could do this job and that you your colleagues could and and you have a certain amount of respect and and um so there's not quite that sense of i'm the boss or something like that it, mm -hmm. it's just it's not that that way anymore um i think um you know you have the privilege of, of playing the first parts and and playing um with the other principles and um i think that's that's it's a wonderful opportunity you know um i think the uh the other part of that you know, the question of in terms of what people don't recognize i think is um one on the one hand you know we all feel pressure and we all feel the uh the amount of anxiety that you feel on a professional level is is very high and the you know i mean i think that's the one thing i think we all assume that you get to a certain level professionally and then you're, you're, you're done with the nerves or whatever you're done with the anxiety or, or the, um, you know, if you, if you don't play well, I think that's the one thing that, uh, we try to avoid is being professional. I mean, how bad you feel and how, and how, uh, how it really affects you. Um, I think, um, the, also the, just the amount of work, 
you know, that you that's necessary, and um, it becomes your life. It's a, it's a very uh, it's not for it's not a hobby, um, and you know, the, all the great players that I that I know are are they're just at it all the time. This is what you do day in and day out, and it's a, it's a never ending kind of process. Um, so yeah, there's that, and and just the realities of of the grind of the job. To you know, you're playing three or four shows. Some people I don't we don't do four, but um, you know, there's many orchestras that do four, and that's a kind of a, a crazy amount. Uh, and just dealing with that and, and learning to part of the job that that you learn on the job is that sometimes it's about survival. You know, in the sense of you you have a lot of material, you have a, things are constantly changing, new rap and all that kind of thing, and it can get um, uh, it, it's, it can wear on you. It's so interesting to hear you say that, um, you know, the anxiety and the, the act of performing and, and having that sort of, uh, I guess in some ways it's almost a, a, a rush. It's anxiety, but it's also a, a rush. Um, Martin Frost said a similar thing about that. Like he, he, he looks very focused on stage, but, but it doesn't mean he's not still experiencing all that stuff, you know, behind the scenes. I, I guess I should reframe my one question a little bit. I, I didn't mean leadership from kind of like a, almost a business perspective. I, I meant it more from a sort of musical context and, and how that's working within um, the, right. the ensemble. Okay. Yeah, no, I think that that's the biggest thing is you're always um, uh, trying to improve. There's always something that you're, you're trying to, to improve. There's always, in other words, there's no point in which we say, Oh, it's, it's perfect. We're done. Um, and I think, um, I think that pressure is, is, is great too. You know what I mean? There's always something that they could have been better. Um, and you know, for example, you know, my colleagues and I are, are going, we're listening after you do kind of do a post postmortem now with, with concerts where we go listen and kind of evaluate with each other, um, which is really fantastic actually. And, um, but isn't necessarily fun. You know what I mean? If you have two people going, ah, oh, I think you're really sharp there. It's kind of, <laughs> and you felt okay about it and you, where you didn't realize, um, I think that's, that's, that's difficult, but I think, um, but that's fun too. I mean, it, it, there's different kinds of fun, I suppose. Um, the, there's a, an intellectual kind of satisfaction that comes from solving these problems or trying to address the problems, um, and be more consistent. And, um, and then we really serve, I mean, it's ultimately about serving the music. And, and I think that's, that's the other thing you have to have some sort of underlying philosophical, uh, understanding or argument for why you do what you do. Um, otherwise playing equipment becomes more of a fashion statement than, than uh, anything long term, you know, and then it's easy to get caught in some, uh, kind of crazy, uh, uh, circles, you know, so. So you'll sit together and actually analyze the, the recording of like a past concert and work through it as kind of as a team and, and talk about things that could be improved or changed or. Sure. I mean, like sometimes you're trying to understand like who's responsible for a chord being out of tune. Um, and you know, you hear, it's also like sometimes you're in the orchestra, you're listening to pitch in a certain section and you're matching that, but not aware that you maybe have gotten too high or, or too low or whatever, uh, or the balance is out, out of whack. Again, sometimes, you know, you, you um, we're not, we're on top of the instrument, so we don't really know how much the instrument's really resonating and projecting, and sometimes you're a little bit too loud or, or not enough, and uh, or something gets really vertical, you know, you're playing a phrase and it just really feels like this, and, and uh, you know, that's where you feel like, oh, I'm being really musical, but what's happening is you're losing the enunciation of the, of the, the notes, and it's getting a little foggy. So I have a question about that, actually, because it's, I find it interesting. I think that a lot of times for, for players, especially those who are, are not um, in a permanent position, um, they go and they sub or something into an orchestra. Everyone always feels uh, quite a bit on edge in that kind of situation. And I think the audition circuit in some ways, it, it builds this mindset of, of sort of um, isolation as a player. How yeah. would you advise within a section to sort of try and build this sort of camaraderie towards moving towards a goal as a team like that? Well, I think as a sub, it's a very difficult situation because you're having to make adjustments, um, not just on how the orchestra plays and, and that sort of thing, but also the, the psychology of, of the people that you're working with. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone's coming at, 
at a different level and, and everyone has different ideas about how they approach the thing, uh, the job. And I think as a sub, the biggest thing that you're trying to do is figure out, um, uh, I, I think in terms of mindset, instead of, it's very easy to feel like you got to suck up to somebody to, to maintain the, the thing. But I think if we look at it in terms of trying to figure out how to solve the problem of how to make the adjustments so that the, for, you know, if I'm playing second or something like that and I was playing with someone, I, I would want to try to figure out what is it that they need? What is it that they're looking for? What is their approach? Are they looking from uh, a more nuts and bolts technically dictated or kind of intonation approach? Do they want a lot of freedom? Do they want someone who's more kind of mirroring them in terms of balance and, Mm -hmm. um, uh, or they want a lot, you know, um, they want a big player. Do they want a lot of support? Do they, um, some people are real chatty. Some people are really quiet, you know, and, and just getting, uh, making those sorts of adjustments, I think is, is, uh, the best route. It's hard to do because you kind of have to step back from it. Um, yeah. we all feel like we've got opinions and we all feel like we want to matter. Um, but I think the, the benefit of, if you can step back is that you can, can work better with people. And I think ultimately, um, people like and, and respond to, to someone who's going to make them feel better and sound better. Yeah. I like that actually almost putting your ego to the side and, and approaching it from a musical context is a really, that's a really compelling idea actually. Um, a lot of people's careers are going to start either by subbing um, and that will happen whether it's through the audition circuit and they get discovered that way. Um, but what advice would you have to those people who are currently on the audition circuit, sort of grinding it out, trying to, trying to get a job? Well, I think, um, the, let me describe the people that I've, I've seen that have been successful. Um, I think there, there are very few people that just walk into big job day one it does happen of course but it's it's a little unusual Mm -hmm. most of the people i've seen that have been successful at in the audition process are the it's a more of a character trait it's more of the fact that these people are incredibly determined willing to do whatever they need to to get better um and um i think the fire i think that fire the willingness to to just practice i mean you have to be a little nuts to do this i mean it's not (laughs) balanced lifestyle um and um and that's why you know if you're looking for balance in your life this isn't probably the career for you but um but i think most of the people that do this are compelled you know it's not like you got to tell um ricardo to go practice you know he goes and he he does it you know um he he wants to you could it'd be you'd have to stop him or and 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 I don't think that's unique to him. I think you see that with a lot of the professionals, and and in some ways there's a, a certain camaraderie uh, between people that have gotten jobs because of that. Because you appreciate um, whether you you like their playing, you don't like their playing. What you do appreciate is um, the effort and the determination to to get the job. Because we we lose more. I mean, significantly more than we win. You know. I mean, it's. Um, it's incredible, you know, the amount of emotional abuse that we all have to go through to get a job. Yeah. It's, it's interesting to me too, because so you're saying a lot of people end up getting their first job in a smaller orchestra. And, and I've seen that amongst my colleagues, actually people I went to school with they're they're starting yeah. their first gigs and, and moving through that. How does one maintain that level of persistence while they're now actively working? How do you keep looking for the next opportunity and, and me- mentally and physically? I mean, well, I think the thing is you, you, you have to have that sort of, um, curiosity, that determination to keep on trying to get better, you know, like really ask yourself, is it what I want musically? Mm-hmm. Um, I think one of the things that drives people equipment wise is, is, um, um, is that idea of trying to solve those problems the things that allow you to do things a, a little more easily with a better sound or whatever that might be. Um, and I think that that's, um, that's what I'm talking about a little bit with the audition that you can't teach that it's people love it or they don't. And, um, or, or they're sort of in between, you know, I guess, and, but they don't have, there is a big step, you know, between, between them. Any advice for dealing with either the success or rejection at an audition? Well, I think the, the, the advice I'd have about rejection is, is, or even any experience, you know, you play a concert and you, you, 
you tank out or something like that is it's telling you something it's it's information it's not if you take it personally it, it's too much um i think if you can sort of step back and say you know i, I had an audition and i had a problem with firebird or, or whatever daphnis and it's you're learning something from this process you're learning did you really prepare um did you have problems with your reads did you have problems with your mouth whatever it is that's information that you need to resolve you know those problems those issues are are things that you have to focus and and try to to resolve in whatever circumstance you know um learning to uh, and that's one of the big things about being a professional which they don't teach you in school um is that it's all about adjustment and this is something i learned from lauren kit and it was brilliant at it and um you, every day is different and you have you cannot it, it, you know, you can't use the same read, you can't use the same whatever and expect the same results every day as, as things change. And it's all about adjustment. You you play with a different conductor, you play in a different hall, you just can't just and be expected to, to sound uh, the same. Yeah, sometimes we're focused so much on getting it completely right or reproducible, an excerpt or something like that, but it doesn't right. necessarily take into account all the different things that might might happen on the way. You know, yeah, I mean, if the hall is really dry, it sounds different than when it's really humid and you, you make small adjustments. You have a conductor. Um, and, and I think this is a, 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 the other thing that's really changed is that the attitude, I mean, 30, 40 years ago, I mean, this is how we do it. And that's take it or leave it. And um, now you're really under the gun to to uh, with the various conductors, the various levels of conducting is trying to figure out how to make this stuff work and make the orchestra still sound good mm -hmm. despite and sometimes uh, despite the level of conducting. Even if you don't like the idea, you have to make it work somehow. Yeah, it's, your, it's literally your job, right? <laughs> right, but I don't yeah. know that we, the musicians approached it that way. No? Yeah. yeah, yeah. How does one practice being adaptable? That seems like a, a new realm we're kind of entering. <laughs> well, I think you learn it by... Um, by learning about equipment and learning about read making or read uh, work, working on reads or whatever it is. And, um, and from there you, you develop a better sense of what the materials do. Um, you know, equipment is really important um, and understanding, but it's more than just trying it and sort of like, okay, this is going to be the perfect setup. Um, you know, the weather and understanding weather in the seasons in your area and, and, different parts of the country as you go and take auditions. And um, I, I think that's the biggest, you know, there's no substitute for trying different things. I think if, if you get into the habit of, I think it would be incredibly difficult if you played the same setup for eight years and then tried to pick another set of horns, it would be really difficult. So reflecting on your career um, with the National Symphony, are there any particular moments that stand out as something that was just a real, either a musical breakthrough or something just extremely memorable that you'd like to share? Um, you know, it's always hard to say. I think the winning the job was, was pretty, uh, you know, when I won the assistant job, I was very, that was very thrilling. Um, I think over the years, um, I think there's been a lot of, we've had some great good conductors and, and there've been moments like when we've had Dutois and, uh, a few others that have been really, really special. We were just in um, Russia at the um, Rostropovich Festival, and um, we played Schubert uh, Nine uh, in Moscow at the Conservatory with Eschenbach. And for me, that will always be very memorable. I think, um, you know, there's certain conductors that you have a great rapport with, and I, I've always really liked him. The, the tempos can be, uh, or are certainly criticized as being too slow, but I think there's a musicianship and a, and a level of expression that's remarkable. For those around the world, I mean, I imagine most people are familiar with the National Symphony, but is there an element to it where uh, a touring element that is more regular, or is it mostly well, local performances? Well, with Eschenbach, we certainly tour, toured uh, more than we, we had previously, and uh, I think it's been good for us. You know, I mean, I think it's uh, it's good for the orchestra, um, just learning to play in different environments and, and playing in better halls. To to be to be honest, we we play in an extraordinarily large uh, dead space, and um, 
you know, it's wonderful to go into a hall like the conservatory in Moscow where you think it and it happens and mm. it's having to really create a crescendo, really create a, a, a contrast. And it's nice to be in a place where it just moves, you think, and you can lift and hover and do all these sorts of things that you just can't quite do in a, in a debtor space. So, so you also, um, you study with Larry Coombs, Larry McDonald, and Donald Montanero. Is there yeah. a story um, that you'd like to share about working with any of those three or maybe a short one from each or? Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, um, I should be careful. I, I think the, uh, they're all, I, I got something from each of them. And, and um, I think the Larry McDonald who, uh, I think it was a great teacher. I mean, it really understood how, um, it sounds silly, but I think this is one thing that a lot of people don't have is, is the basis to really practice and understand how to, the idea of using systems, you know, for example, speech with articulation and using something like that. I, I think I, I definitely got that from him and from Larry, I think it was just a, a practical approach and of, of, of how to be an orchestral musician, how to take an audition. Um, there's a lot of nuts and bolts there that from, from his experience, I mean, he's a remarkable clarinetist. And, um, I think, um, he, sometimes you want to feel like everything's that it's really complicated. And I think for Larry, things weren't, and they were very simple. And, but everything that he taught and showed you was, I mean, I still use it today. I mean, the idea of, like, for example, like making sure that I'm breathing in time before I play, get the, you know, I mean, this really basic things that you would think aren't such a big deal, but you, you, you really use those things, I think, in the orchestra. Can um, you go into that a little bit? How did he describe that exactly to you? Well, I think the, the biggest thing is, you know, sometimes, you know, you used to be, for example, that I would count and then I'd play, right? Um, I think that he also liked the idea of breathing so that the pulse was already established more like a pendulum before you'd actually uh, start a phrase or, or whatever. And especially in the orchestra, I think so often people are reacting to what they hear and then they're trying to grab the pulse from that. And I think Larry was brilliant in the sense of explaining um, to me really that what you're doing is you're listening to where the pulse is and where it's going to be. And that's where you place, you kind of like hop on or hop off, hop off. But I think the inhalation and breathing in time like that makes it, you become part of the pulse then rather than just kind of like trying to jump from a dead stop. And did that become like a physical element to, to sort of as a cueing type thing? Like, um, um, visibly, I mean, not, not especially. Um, I think though in, in the orchestra, we don't move a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, but those sort of physical cues are, are sufficient for your, your colleagues. You know, if they see you breathe and they, they feel the pulse too. So it's, it's in a, perhaps in a, a unconscious cue. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a lot of fun. Um, it's great to talk about this stuff and it's great to talk about, you know, those teachers too, because um, if, I think the, the one thing I will say about all this process is you really appreciate, um, you know, what people have done for you and the knowledge that people have shared with you because um, like in life, you know, either you're over or underpaying and, and I certainly feel with my teachers, I, I, I owe them. Uh, a huge amount and and people like you know Maury and, and Van Dorn and all these you know David Gould and all these people I I really feel like I'm indebted to them yes, I love that well thank you so much again for coming on the show I, I really really enjoyed talking with you and I hope to uh, at some point have the chance to do so again uh, thank you so much it's, it's been a lot of fun Thank you so much for listening to the Clarinet Podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode and want to learn more, please see the show notes for this and all other episodes at www.clarinet.com. Did you know that Patreon backers now get access to extended high resolution audio episodes and other bonus content? See www.clarinet.com slash Patreon to learn more. Be sure to tune in next time for a conversation with Matthias Muller, who invented a product called the Sabre. I first featured him on episode 33 of the podcast when his product was in its infancy, but it's now almost ready for commercial production. Also in the coming weeks, I've got a conversation to share from the four play clarinet ensemble. Those girls talk about, you know, what's in a name, first of all, how they picked that sort of 
somewhat spicy name. And uh, also they talk about how they go about filming their music videos. And that might sound like an odd topic for a clarinet podcast, but they actually go out in places like the desert <laughs> and film recreations of pop songs um, along with their own original arrangements. Their videos are getting upwards of 100,000 views on YouTube, sometimes much more than that. And I think they're doing something really, really cool. Also joining me on the podcast is the famous Stanley Drucker, who of course was the, well, he needs no introduction, but he was the principal clarinetist of the New York Philharmonic Orchestra for over 60 years. We talk about his new upcoming Heritage Collection CD release, which spans his 30-year performance career of playing not the typical orchestral music you might expect, but chamber music, solo clarinet pieces, some of which are actually performed with his wife, and she actually joins me on the podcast as well. Many other interesting things coming up. If you'd like to be the first to know, please subscribe with your email address at www.clarinet.com. This will also give you the chance to win giveaways mentioned on the podcast. This episode of Clarinet was brought to you by Tadaria Woodwinds. Thank you so much for listening. Sanding, shaping, balancing. For centuries, mastering your instrument meant mastering these crafts too. But now, D'Addario is refining craftsmanship for the 21st century by refining their reeds and mouthpieces with the world's most innovative techniques. So you can spend less time sanding, shaping, and balancing, and more time perfecting your own craft. To learn more about the new era of craftsmanship from D'Addario Woodwinds, visit daddario.com woodwinds.